Good morning, Chair Postman, members Ballendroff and Garrett. The mics are on. Everything's working. The recording has begun. Let's go. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, everybody. We'll convene the Board Caucus meeting for Tuesday, October 15th, 2024. Uh, thanks for your patience. We just had a few technical problems at uh, this point over at this end, but we're all good. Um, we have uh, one presentation on our agenda today. We are going to be briefed on the FDA tobacco inspection program that, that we do with them. And I am going to turn this over to Season Ekstrom, the uh, agency's FDA program coordinator. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, so thank you for uh, allowing me to give this presentation. Um, the FDA tobacco inspection program uh, has been part of the agency for quite some time now, but I think a lot of people in the agency and especially some of our newer staff just aren't as familiar with the program and what we do. So I am going to just give an overview of the program and then I'm happy to answer any questions you guys might have at the end. Um, I will share my screen here. Um, okay. Are you guys able to see my screen? Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, so I'll get started. So just to give a little bit background on the FDA program here, um, the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act, which we just commonly refer to as the Tobacco Control Act, was signed into law in June of 2009, which gave the FDA authority to regulate the manufacture, distribution, and marketing of tobacco products. Um, to better help uh, provide this and in, in to follow through on the law and to make sure that retailers were doing what they were supposed to do. Um, FDA works with the Center for Tobacco Products, which is CTP, which is a division of the FDA, and issues contracts to states to assist with compliance check inspections at retail establishments to determine com uh, retailers compliance with these new federal laws and regulations. LCB was one of the first 15 states to contract with the FDA in September of 2010. We are one of 15 states to join this pilot program. Um, initially, this program was pretty small. The FDA uh, commissioned our current LEOs to do these compliance checks for us. So this was done on a part-time basis. It was initially a one-year contract, and we only at that time checked approximately 20% of tobacco retailers. Uh, as time went on over the years, we have now um, and have a pretty established program that has a full-time program coordinator, which is myself, and then six full-time FDA inspectors across the state. Um, oops, I think I am going too far, excuse me. Okay, so just to give a little bit of a contract overview. So we are currently in a four-year contract with the FDA. This consists of a base year and then three option years. Each option year uh, requires a signed modification to execute the updated terms of the new year. So this is signed both with the contract specialists on the FDA side and then on our side, it is signed by the CFO. Um, there is, we are currently in the last year of our four-year contract, so it, are, it ends in May of 2025. We anticipate the next RFP or request for proposal will be posted um, sometime at the beginning of 2025. They don't announce when it's going to be posted until right when it does get posted. Typically, this is we have 30 days to respond to this proposal, um, which consists of approximately a 45 page response. It's a technical proposal that just goes over all of the details of how we're going to fulfill uh, the requirements of the contract a business proposal, which goes over all of the financial side of the contract. We work with our budget team and finance a lot during this portion of it, just to make sure we are covering any potential costs that we might um, have during the full length of the contract. And then we go over some details of our past performance, just to prove that we are able to fulfill these type of contracts. Um, we are not competing against anybody else when we submit this proposal to them. Um, we're basically just competing against ourselves and there's some negotiation with the FDA um, back and forth just on um, the details of how we're going to run the contract. But there's no other agencies in the state of Washington that go after this contract. 
Our program is fully funded by the FDA, so we submit invoices monthly to them. I work with um, our budget team on that, and um, any costs that we accrue for the program are billed um, on the back end, and we are, we are reimbursed um, through this contract. All of these costs must be outlined in the contract, so we can't bill for anything that we didn't initially request for, so which makes writing the proposal of our contract really important. We have to think of everything that might end up um, being a cost for us. So the FDA has a goal to establish contracts with state agencies in every U.S. state and territory. Currently, every U.S. state and territory is being checked in these compliance checks, but some of those states are covered by third-party entities outside of the state um, if they haven't been able to um, get a contract yet. Part of managing the contract and ensuring we're fulfilling the requirements of the contract is FDA does site visits every two years. During the site visit, we go over contract review um, just because all the state contracts are a little bit different. So we go over the details of our contract and then we go over the details of how we run the program, our policies, our procedures, our training programs. Um, they do personnel file audits of all of the inspectors and some of our investigative aides that work for us. They do an evidence audit. Um, all of our evidence is stored in our enforcement evidence facility. Um, they will pull random pieces of evidence to make sure we are storing it properly and we have it um, sealed properly. Our most recent site visit was in May of 2024. Um, it went great. There was no findings or issues um, and they actually said that they were going to use some of our training materials and things as um, for other state programs just to give them guidance on how to do these things. So they were really impressed with the way we run the program, which is great. So this is a org chart of um, how our FDA program uh, fits within the agency. So we are under enforcement education, and then we are under the deputy chief of administration. And under that is our enforcement program manager, Judy Edwards. And then there's my position as the program coordinator. And I oversee um, six, inspectors across the state. Um, our longest term inspector has been with the program since 2013, essentially since we started hiring full-time inspectors to do these positions. And then our newest inspector is out of Tacoma and he actually just started in August of 2024. So we have a wide range of experience on our team. Um, Okay, so as I mentioned, we're housed in the Enforcement and Education Division. Um, I am the program coordinator and I've been with the FDA program since January of 2017. And I have been in my position as the program coordinator since March of 2022. The FDA requires we have a backup program coordinator, essentially just to fulfill the program coordinator needs um, if I am unavailable for some reason. So we have one of our full-time inspectors, Carrie Brown out of Olympia. She is trained as my backup. She, majority of her role is being an inspector full-time, but when I am unavailable or out of town, um, she does take over my, my duties um, and provides the communication to the FDA that they need. All of our inspection data is tracked in the FDA's tobacco inspection management system. We call that TIMS. Um, so we don't enter any of our in inspection data into the EN or any of our internal agency um, databases. Everything is external in the FDA's database. And myself and the inspectors are the only ones in the, the agency that have access to that system. Um, myself and my BPC both have FDA issued laptops, so we have FDA emails and all of our communication with the FDA is done directly on those laptops. Um, their IT manages that and all of the um, program related documentation is stored on those laptops as well. This is just an overview of our coverage areas. Um, just so you guys can see, we have six inspectors across the state. So with the exception of our King County inspector, all of them have very large territories to cover. They spend a lot of time traveling. They spend a lot of time in their vehicles driving um, to these different establishments. And even within King County, even though it's a smaller area, obviously we all know there are a um, large amount of retailers within that smaller area. So what do our tobacco, uh, FDA tobacco inspectors do? So FDA tobacco inspectors conduct inspections at all Washington State tobacco product 
retail lo locations to determine compliance with federal laws and regulations. This includes the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act and the Tobacco Control Act. Our inspectors go through a six week training and program in the field, which also includes extensive online training and testing, um, which is created directly by the FDA staff. So our goal is to conduct one inspection at every tobacco retailer in the state each year. We want to make sure that we touch each retailer um, at least once per year, and we will only visit them once per year if they are in compliance. And that is part of our contract. We are not allowed to um, check a place who is in compliance um, more than one time per calendar year. If the retailer is out of compliance, the FDA may assign a follow-up inspection, um, which then could result in multiple checks per year at the same establishment. So approximately 85 of our inspect inspectors' workload is completed in the field, and all of these inspections and reports are completed on a federal iPhone that they are assigned, um, and that relate, or relays the information directly back into the TIMS system. So we are almost completely paperless with the exception of one form that we hand to um, retailers when we do one of our types of inspections, and I'll go over that in a little bit. So two, two main types of inspections, it's undercover buys and advertising and labeling inspections. Our undercover buys account for approximately 80% of our inspections. So these are conducted to determine compliance with federal laws pertaining to youth access, sale of tobacco products to underage persons, and age verification requirements that the FDA has. During these checks, we use our investigative aids, and the investigative aids are attempting to purchase a predetermined tobacco product. This is something we discuss with them prior to them entering the establishment so they know what they are looking for and what they are attempting to purchase. If no sale is made during these checks, then the IA and the inspector exit the establishment and the inspector documents accordingly on their um, FDA iPhone. If there is a sale, the inspector and IA still exit the establishment they then go to a safe location, usually off-site, um, drive away to a safer location to complete their both of their narrative reports and process the evidence. So even if a sale is made, there is no contact made with the licensee at this point. This is something that is very different from when our enforcement officers do their compliance checks as they then go in and um, make contact with the licensee. We do not do that. Um, our notification of a sale is sent out by the FDA. They re will receive, the retailer will receive something in the mail, usually within a week of when the sale occurred. They'll detail the what happened in the sale, um, the time, place, location, all of that, and then the follow-up needed by the FDA. So our current compliance rate is approximately 85%, and this is something we've seen pretty standard over the past about year, year and a half. It's remained about 85%. The second type of check that we do is our advertising and labeling inspections. These account for approximately 20% of our total inspections. These are typically only conducted when retailers have been out of compliance, which usually means they have sold to an underage person recently. During these checks, um, we do not use investigative aids and our inspectors enter the establishment. They introduce themselves uh, to the retailer and they issue a notice of inspection, which we call, a, we call a Form 482. This is the only paper documentation that we use during our any of our work. Um, during these inspections, we are looking also for retailer compliance with federal regulations and laws, but beyond just youth access. We're looking for advertising and warning label requirements, if there is any sale of unauthorized products or unauthorized product placement, and we want to verify the business ownership and location information just so we can update our TIM system. Um, all of the licensees and their information is entered um, from us or for the FDA from information we give them. So it is not automatically updated um, when tobacco licensees update their information, we have to actually do that. So this is, allows us to get make sure we have accurate information for them. Um, there is a third type of check that we do, and it's very rare that we have done them, so I don't really account this for a main type of inspection, but the FDA may pursue a no tobacco sales order against a retailer that has had a total of five or more repeated violations within 36 months. Um, at this time, retailers will be prohibited from selling regulated tobacco products at a specific location during that NTSO order. 
And the FDA will typically assign us an NTSO inspection to check the retailer during that time. This is similar to an undercover buy in the sense that we are going in and attempting to purchase a tobacco product, but we do not utilize an investigative aid. Our inspectors go and do these checks on their own. And we've only done eight of these in Washington so far. So like I said, not, not really a very common check at this point. So our um, adjudication process and the whole process when you have a violation, like I said, it's a little bit different from the officer side. Um, if they're the investigative aid and inspector go in and attempt to purchase a product, the results are sent directly back to the FDA. They perform their own initial review. If they determine that a violation did occur, they will send a notice of compliance check inspection within one week to the retailer letting them know that there was a potential sale to a minor. Um, the FDA at that time will review the evidence and our reports and everything that we submitted through the system. And if this is the first time violation for the retailer, they're just gonna get a warning letter stating you know, what the violation was and um, hoping that they can rectify it so it doesn't happen in the future. If it is not their first time sale, they will likely get a civil money penalties um, or no tobacco sales order, depending on how many violations they've previously had. All of the inspection results, once they've gone through the entire legal process with the FDA team, are posted on the FDA website, um, and then retailers are subject to reinspection. So we have recently, actually as of yesterday, just added our FDA, um, some FDA information on our external website, um, lcb.wa.gov. And so we have links to information about the violation process, um, links to where the public can go and look up um, previous checks that have gone through the system, gone through the entire process and um, violations throughout the state. So they're able to easily access that information. And we posted the links because sometimes the FDA page is a little bit difficult to navigate. This is an overview of the monetary penalties that retailers can receive. Um, so obviously, as I mentioned, if it's their first violation, it's just going to be a warning letter and there's no monetary penalty attached to that. If they have two within a 12 month period, um, the penalty can be up to $356. These are the maximum penalties. So obviously there can be some negotiation with the FDA and the retailer um, during this process. And the maximum, as you can see, it gets pretty high. If you have six within a 48 month period, it can be up to just over $14,000. So the penalties do get pretty heavy, um, the more sales and the more violations that these retailers have. I do want to note that this is something relatively new, but um, the, the FDA is based on the FDA and C Act going um, through with um, CMP cases for retailers who are selling unauthorized tobacco products. And this penalty is up to just over $21,000. So this is a very significant penalty um, for retailers who are selling any products that have not been authorized by the FDA. And this is something that they've just recently started doing, so we don't have a lot of data or information on it. I know there has been at least one retailer um, in our state that has is going through this process, but um, there is a list on the FDA site of authorized tobacco products. Um, and most of the current products that we're seeing on the market, some of these newer vape products, things like that, most of those are not authorized. So this is something that we're probably going to see more of, and the FDA is taking this very seriously, and they are pursuing maximum penalties allowed in these cases. This is just a screenshot of what the website looks like in the database if you want to look up um, tobacco compliance check outcomes. And so I pulled this last week, this screenshot, and as you can see, it says includes decisions through the end of August. So their process and their adjudication process can be a little bit lengthy, um, which is why we are not allowed to really give any information out on sales at particular locations until they've gone through the entire process. Um, once they have gone through the process, that information is completely public and can be found on this on their website. You can look up everything from specific retailers, um, 
checks or decision dates within a certain date range, time, time frame, or certain products sold. So that information is open to the public. And this is just some of our stats um, over the first three quarters of the year. So as you can see, we're pretty consistent. Um, second quarter, we had some vacancies that got filled, so things went up a little bit, but we are pretty consistent on our compliance rate. Like I said, averaging about 85% um, in the number of compliance checks that we are conducting each quarter. I did, in, I did include incomplete inspections on this as well, even though these aren't part of our official compliance check numbers, just because these are places that our inspectors do spend time to go to. And sometimes they just can't complete the inspection because they're closed, they're out of business, they no longer sell tobacco products, or they're just out of tobacco stock at the time. But they are checks that are completed. So we do like to include those. And then the second quarter is the most recent time that we did an NTSO follow up check. That was in June of 2024. Um, and I believe that retailer was in compliance at the time. So there was no issues there. So that is all I have for my presentation. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody may have um, at this time. That's great. Thank you for that. That was really interesting. Thank you. I should have, gotten, I should have asked these for this a long time ago because I learned a lot. <laughs> um, we got a couple of questions. Uh, Ollie? No, I was just going to say thank you. This was valuable information. I didn't even realize that we did this. So thank you for this. Yeah, of course. And I'm, I, like I said, our program's been around since 2010. And I think because, well, I'm not really sure why, but it's not really a well known of what we do. Our, my inspectors work really hard. They do a lot of work out there in the field. And so I appreciate the opportunity to be able to share what they do. Um, and what we, you know, bring to the agency. I think it's definitely valuable for, for our agency. Yeah, that's great. Jim? Uh, thank you, uh, Season, for the presentation. It was really good. Uh, I had the opportunity to see C uh, Season get an award at the e, e retreat recently in training, so I wanted to just publicly congratulate you for that. Um, okay. It's super interesting. I just, along with what uh, Board Member Garrett just said, I just had a conversation because there's some legislation being proposed by another state agency around vaping, flavored vape products that I know pretty well how we regulate and our enforcement on the tobacco, the alcohol side and the cannabis side, but I've always found the tobacco side a little confusing. Uh, so this was super helpful. I really appreciate it. Uh, a couple of questions. One, like, I'm left wondering, because I am familiar with the SINAR uh, requirements and the SINAR checks that we do um, or that are done. Like, how how do you, are, is there overlap there? Do they coordinate or is that a whole separate unit within E&E that does the SINAR checks? So that's a whole separate unit. The SINAR checks are completed um, by our officers. Um, I believe it's mostly the vapor team and the tobacco tax team. I'm not 100% sure on that, but those are completed by our officers. So they are looking, even though they're they're relatively similar, a lot of times, obviously, we're looking to make sure that we're preventing youth access and we're not selling to anybody who's underage. Um, it's just the difference between a state and a federal check. So all of okay. our checks are going against federal law, um, which isn't much different. Uh, obviously, now that we've all got on the same page of the 21 and over for tobacco. Um, that was a little bit different for a few years when it first switched over, but our checks are generally the same. We actually on the federal side do require um, that anybody under the age of, it just switched recently, anybody under the age of 30 um, is carded. And I mm. don't believe on the state side there is a requirement for carding. Obviously, we can't sell to anybody underage, but I don't think there's a carding requirement to check ID. So on the federal side, it's a little bit different. Um, but they're just checks run by by two different groups, but both under um, E&E. &E. Okay, great. Um, so that's, again, helpful. It helps me understand the tobacco unit a little bit more. Um, so the last question I had was around the um, qualifications of the staff you've indicated so you started with just one now you've got like six or eight i can't remember exactly think six uh and you just added a new one and as you were talking i was wondering about like what are the qualifications of individuals that you hire for these positions what are you looking for when you hire so we like to have somebody um it is required that they have um either a bachelor's degree or equivalent of 
experience um, or combination of experience and education. Um, essentially, we want somebody who is able to, ideally, if they have some sort of investigative um, background, but it's not required. Um, they do go through a six week training program and they also run, go through a background check, not as thorough as the officers go through, but it is a background check. We have to meet st federal standards for getting the commission. So we do their background checks and reference checks and, um, drug testing, just like we do all of our staff here in enforcement. And, um, then they go through a six week training program. So they are working hand in hand with one of our seasoned inspectors um, for six weeks, shadowing their training process, um, what they do during inspections. And then that inspector is then shadowing the new inspector while they do theirs to make sure they're pretty comfortable. And then there's some pretty extensive online training that the FDA has created that they go through just going through all of the details of our inspections. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And again, thank you for your uh, work and leadership in this particular area. It's super important. This is super important work that E&E &E does um, and keeping product out of the hands of young people until people are of a certain age is uh, a critical part of what we do as an agency. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, a couple of questions. One, um, how much uh, data uh, sharing mixing is there? So if if your people find a violation at a store. Do, do the other E&E &E people know that that's been done, so don't go to that store or could that still happen? And if they do, do they learn what the, the FDA record of violation is? Um, so there is not a whole lot of mixing of between what my unit does and then what the officers do. Um, and the reason for that is part of our contract is, is, as I briefly mentioned in the presentation, we're not allowed to discuss checks um, or results of checks that we've done until FDA has gone through their entire adjudication process. Because as we all know, as they're going through that process, things can change. Um, you know, we don't know what the outcome of that is going to be. And so we don't let the officers know like, hey, we're going to check all of these places um, or we just checked these places. Now we do have access to the EN. So if we know that there is a potential issue or things um, with a particular retailer, we can look up that information. And of course, if we notice any major safety concerns or things that the officers should be aware of. We do pass along that information, not directly related to, hey, there was a sale at this particular location. But if we see some major safety violations or a relatively large youth presence at maybe an age-restricted location um, or stateside violations that maybe the FDA isn't necessarily focusing on, but we know is a stateside violation, we can't pass that information along to our officers. Um, because it doesn't interfere with the process that the FDA goes through. Now, once the information is public on that website, you know, anybody can access the results of those checks once they've gone through their entire process. So but um, we don't use that data. Like if we have somebody who's on a third violation of a state violation for sale to minor, and they also have two FDA violations, those are separate and yes. we don't we don't increase penalties on the state side because somebody's violated on the federal side. Correct. Yeah, we do not do that. And you, you, you talked about that adjudication process that the FDA goes through, and that there's a uh, they can uh, there's a uh, maximum level of a fine, uh, but they can come down lower. Do you know what that process is? Do, is that based on mitigating factors that the retailer licensee presents or how do they decide that? Um, I am actually not sure because they don't typically include that in uh, uh, us in that process that's done with their yeah. attorneys. Um, there are times when if they believe a case is getting ready to go to trial, um, if it's going to get that far, which it's not common that it does, but if it is going to get that far, they will interview our inspectors and with them create a declaration um, that is signed by them, just certifying the details of the case. Um, and then I think within the time that I've been here, we've had only one time that we've actually had to have an inspector testify and um that's obviously over the phone because they're in Washington, D.C. But uh, other than that, they don't typically include us in that process uh, of what those are. So I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure what would be those factors that might drop the fine down. 
and your team's participation in that is just to send the report that they have to do anyhow, and then FDA takes that information for the correct. penalty setting part of it. We're not involved in that. Yeah, that is correct. Okay, okay. Um, the uh, investigative aides, do they, you have your own? Do you set, use the same IAs that enforcement might use for other cases? Yes, we use the same investigative aides. Um, so anybody that we hire, the officers use as well. There are currently, um, we do have some investigative aides that are 16 and 17 years old, and that's just part of our current FDA contract is that we use investigative aides between the age of 16 and 20. Um, and the officers are not allowed to use anybody who's under the age of 18. Um, but beyond that, yes, anybody, we, we typically, once those investigative aides turn 18, we transition them over so that the officers can use them as well. One last question. Do you, do you know how the uh, compliance rate uh, on multiple violations compares on the FDA side and the state side? Do, you know, is the sort of recidivism, if you will, equal? Do people behave better after the feds wrap them on the knuckles or when you do it? <laughs> Um, I am actually not sure about that. I don't know if we've necessarily compared that. I don't know, Director Wax, if you have any information on that, but I am not sure. Those two data points look pretty similar. Okay. Compliance fact, rate and multiple violations. Yeah, they're pretty consistent. I'm not sure about the multiple violations. That's something we can look into, but the compliance rate stays pretty consistent every month. Okay. Okay. That's great. Okay. Oh, and I think I understand this, but just to make sure the the six inspectors, their full time job is FDA work, right? So they're not being assigned to any other E and E work. Correct. And so oh. they are six full time FDA inspectors. They are te state employees, even though we're funded fully by the FDA. So they do obviously have to meet state requirements for trainings and things like that, anything that the LCB specifically requires. And we write that into the contract that there will need to be a certain percentage of their time that's spent to be a state employee. But other than that, they do not complete any stateside work. Okay. Great. Um, any other questions for Susan from the board? No? Okay. Uh, great. Thank you. That really was interesting. I Perhaps I took so long for me to fully understand what Chandra meant when she talks about FDA inspections. So now I know. <laughs> Good. Well, thank you. And uh, like I said, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present my program and what we do. And happy to answer any questions you guys might have in the future. Great. Keep up the good work. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. That was really interesting, huh? <laughs> We need more of that. Um, that's the only agenda item we had. Um, any board member or executive assistant reports? No, no, no. Chandra's got her hand up. Are you, are you just, just waiting like, goodbye or are you raising no. your hand? Okay. I just wanted to share. Glad you enjoyed the FDA presentation. Uh, Matt McCallum will be coming next to give a education program presentation update. And then if there's any other area that you'd like specifically to hear about, uh, let me know, any of you, or um, I'll pick something. <laughs> Terrific. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. With that, we are adjourned and we'll be back next week. Thanks, everybody.